Could it be today? Yes, it could. Biblically speaking, it could be a thousand years from now that Christ returns for his church, and it could be in the next few moments. We know not when, uh, but we do know this is an imminent reality. And just as we open our time discussing the rapture again this morning, I want to read from 2 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul, at the end of his own life, says this, In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do you love the Lord's appearing? Do do you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, could it be today? There's an interesting contrast here in 2 Timothy 4. In the two verses later, the very next paragraph, Paul describes Demas, who loved this present world. Contrast to loved the appearing of Jesus. And my hope is that a study of future things, particularly a study of Jesus' return for his church, would provoke a love for his appearing and a decrease of love for the world. There is a corresponding relationship between our knowledge of what is to come that God has revealed, our anticipation of that reality, and our attachment to this world. We're studying, and this is part two of a three-part series, we're studying the rapture. And if you remember from last week, we we made some initial considerations, I think worth just highlighting once again, first of all, to acknowledge the difficulty of the study of the rapture, because it requires so many texts, so many details, uh, no one text gives every detail about the rapture, that it takes a lot of work to put all of these things together, and so that must produce for us a profound humility patience in study, and grace with one another as we work out these details. We also considered the reality that we must pay attention to the details. God has painted a picture for us in Scripture He wants us to know. We recognize as well that we must pay attention to the importance of this doctrine, like the importance of all doctrine, and um, the importance for us is built into the command in one of the primary texts related to the rapture, do not be ignorant and encourage one another with this truth. And so that leads us to the ethical importance of the study of eschatology in general. Every iteration of some eschatological subject in the Bible comes with an ethical imperative. That is, you need to know these things because it affects profoundly how you are to live. So we can't be ignorant. Uh, We can't shove it to the wayside. We can't say, well, good men disagree, so we better not consider it at all. That is not the Bible's perspective on these things. Um, granted, there, there does require some work, but this is labor that is commanded of the Lord and comes with the ethics that God intends. That is the way we are supposed to live our lives. We talk next about what is the rapture, and we would just summarize it this way. It is those who are dead in Christ in this age, raised supernaturally unto glorified bodies and those who are alive and remain snatched away to be with Jesus, to return to heaven, to be with him forever. All of that happens instantaneously. That's what the rapture is, a a snatching away to be with Jesus, meeting him in the air and going with him back to heaven. And then we tried to tackle the question, when is the rapture? And I say try because we're not done. And in, in effect, the three-week series is not so much an attempt to define the rapture, which is fairly easily definable from the passages available, but an attempt to locate the rapture in the timeline of God's redemptive history. So uh, I put the chart up here again. Um, our view is the pre-tribulational rapture. And uh, do we have that one, Scotty? There it is. So uh, we won't put all the charts again up yet, just what I would say is the right one. Um, And you notice the the you are here mark, that puts us in the church age, the the cross is all the way over on the left, that's the, the, everything in red is Jesus, the things in blue are us, the church. And so Christ has died, he has risen from the dead, he is now in his glorified body, he is at the right hand of the Father, now in heaven, making intercession on behalf of believers. He is sovereign and omnipresent in his deity, he is located in his 
uh, humanity, his uh, location is at the right hand of the Father, but he will return physically to the air to meet his church at the resurrection rapture event. That is the U-turn in red that Jesus makes. The, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who are alive and remain will rise as well to meet the Lord in the air. We will ascend with him to heaven and be with him there until he returns physically, where we will return with him physically, dressed in white linen, Revelation 19, to the earth at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. So the pre-tribulational rapture describes the church being evacuated prior to the tribulation. And that's what this three-week series is detailing, is what you see there in that chart. Uh, We want to turn now, uh, sort of the fourth waypoint in our roadmap through this study, is to look at primary texts. Primary texts. And there are three primary texts detailing the rapture. I want you to turn, first of all, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, gives us probably the most detail about the pre-tribulational rapture. And follow along with me in your Bibles, beginning in verse 13. Paul says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that is, the dead in Christ, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. There's our word for snatched away, that harpoon word, harpazo. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What do we learn about the details of the rapture from this passage? Well, first of all, we we discover that Jesus descends from heaven. And he does so with the accompaniment of three significant events, a shout a voice and a trumpet. You see that there in verse 16. In answer to the question that was bringing sorrow to the Thessalonian believers who had been taught about the imminent return of Christ, what about those who have already died? What happens to them? It's an understandable question. If you lived in the first century, saw the resurrection of Christ and were told, hey, the king went away, but he's coming back. And he's coming back in glory And he's coming back for his own. And Paul here refers to the words of the Lord, that is the words of the Lord Jesus, direct revelation from Jesus about his return. Paul had spent perhaps three Sundays with, or three weeks with the Thessalonian believers, some say longer period of time, but whatever the short period of time he had spent with the Thessalonian believers, he had already instructed them about end times, about eschatology. It was an important enough topic to Paul that it was a sort of a front burner issue with the Thessalonian believers. So much so that when certain Thessalonian Christians began to die, they thought, oh, what about the return of Christ that is imminent, could happen at any time? What happens to them? This text is the answer to that concern. We're not going to have you grieve Thessalonian believers as those who have no hope. Trust me, the dead in Christ will rise first. They will precede us who are alive and remain at the resurrection rapture event. Uh, Do not be concerned for them. They they will precede us and, and they will rise and be glorified and meet Christ in the air when a When Jesus himself, this is such a comforting word in verse 16, the Lord himself, this is a personal event of Jesus Christ where he will come for those who have died in Christ in the church age. And he will come for those who are alive and remain personally. The Lord himself will descend from heaven accompanied by a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. These three announcements, audible announcements, tell us 
that when Jesus comes, this will be a noticeable event, a monumental event, a a life-altering event for those who are in Christ. So the dead in Christ rise to glorified bodies. Those who are alive in Christ are instantly glorified without dying. That is the import of the contrast between those who are sleeping being raised and glorified to those who are alive and remain and meet the Lord in the air. This is a glorification without death. And notice verse 17, we will be caught up together with them. This is why on the chart you have the two arrows, one coming up from the grave, the other immediately following, but together they meet the Lord Jesus in the air. We are caught up. That that again is our word harpazo, Uh, where it's the idea of being snatched away or seized violently. And then uh, that is translated in the Latin to rapturo, which is where we get our English word for rapture. We have the words in in my English Bible, caught up. And we are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Notice that is not a meeting the Lord Jesus on the earth. That is not the return of Christ to the earth. Christ comes here to the air. We meet him in the air along with those who are dead in Christ, verse 17, and then we will always be with the Lord. And we find out from other passages what the Lord will be doing during this time. He will still be in heaven. There will be the Bema seat judgment of believers in heaven. And there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. All of those things preceding Revelation 19 and the return of Christ detailed there in that chapter. There's a second primary text we need to look at. It is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 50 to 52 primarily, but we'll read all the way to the end uh, of the chapter. Notice what Paul says here to the Corinthian believers. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, and here's the ethics of the eschatology, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So just notice, first of all, in the context, what does an understanding of a pre-tribulational rapture induce? Mere intellectual speculation, curiosities, uh, theological fights, not according to the Apostle Paul. Uh, What ought it induce? Steadfastness, immovability, and then always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil in the Lord is not in vain. Relentless, steadfast labor for Jesus. Whatever race the Lord has given you to run, to to run it with all your might, knowing the things Paul just described. Now, what does he describe here about the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 52 in particular? Uh, That you can't get into the glorious presence of Jesus unchanged. There has to be a transformation. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. He describes that radical transformation that must take place. We'll talk about that more in a few moments. And Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Mystery here is not some secret code that's indiscernible. It's something that was not revealed that now is revealed. What was not revealed that's now being revealed on the pages of this text 
not everybody dies. Not every Christian will undergo physical mortality. There is an era, there is a day, there is a twinkling of an eye moment when those who believe in Christ and are alive and are remaining on the earth will not die, but will receive glorified bodies apart from death. You have to have a glorified transformation to be in the glorious presence of Christ. But this mystery now revealed, not all of us will sleep. And it's interesting that Paul says, we. What does that tell you about the doctrine of imminence? Paul believed it could happen to him. He includes himself as one for whom this might have been a possibility. And he says, but we will all be changed. So those who are asleep in Christ, they'll be changed. And those who are alive and remain, they will be changed. How? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When? At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. We see the same details that Paul outlined in 1 Thessalonians 4. A glorious transformation unto resurrected bodies for the dead in Christ with a resurrection for those who are alive and remain with a transformation without going through death. And again, we see the, the sound of a trumpet and the instantaneous transformation just like we saw in 1 Thessalonians 4. One more primary text is John 14. Turn there with me. We'll look at the first three verses. This is part of the upper room discourse on the night before Jesus was betrayed at that last meal he had together with his, with his disciples. He's describing the immediately future events that will transpire. He'll be, tr he'll be betrayed, handed over to the Romans, and crucified. He's going away, and he gives them comfort. I will not leave you as orphans. <laughs> There's many things you can't bear now. I will have to tell you later. Uh, this becomes the, the content of the New Testament that, that Jesus gives through the apostles and prophets. Uh, this is the, the recounting of the details in inerrancy that the Holy Spirit leads the eyewitnesses of Christ as they write out the gospel accounts. This is the promise that Christians will have the Bible. And here, Jesus opens this discussion in chapter 14 with these comforting words. Do not let your heart be troubled. What's the implication there? Their hearts were troubled. They were disturbed by the fact that Jesus was going to leave them. They'd walked with him for three years. He had been their rock. He had been their comfort. He had been the one with all the, the miraculous power and the words of truth. And, and he's leaving? Whatever hopes they had of an earthly kingdom immediately were going away. Now this is a suffering servant and a betrayal and death. And the sheep who followed the shepherd would be scattered. But do not let your heart be troubled. Believe God. Believe me, he says. And then listen to this promise the disciples must believe. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Think about that, a, a dwelling place where, where you live, where you reside, home. In my Father's house. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go, Jesus says, to prepare a place for you. Your home's not here, your, your home is there. And, and I'm going there, I'm going away from here, there, to prepare a place for you, a, a dwelling place in my Father's house. Verse 3 if I go and prepare a place for you, where is that place? There in my Father's house, away from here, there. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again here and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. What is Jesus saying here? In the upper room, he's going away. He will prepare a place for his disciples in his father's house and he will return for them and take them there to that place which he has prepared. This is a warm, affectionate, comforting promise designed by Jesus to cause their hearts 
to not be disturbed, to not be troubled. None of these texts, these three primary passages, are a coming to the earth as Revelation 19. In Revelation 19, Jesus coming to the earth is all the way down to the soil, all the way down to terra firma, where he will stand on the Mount of Olives, split the mountain, and make war against his enemies. He will be riding a white horse, he will have the sword, he will have the the saints behind him dressed in linen, he will wage war against his enemies and lay waste to the world's armies. That's Revelation 19. These texts are not that event. These texts present to us Jesus coming for his disciples of the church age, receiving them to himself that they may be with him. A glorious resurrection event for the dead in Christ and a glorifying transformation event for those who are alive and remain when he returns for them. Uh, Pull up the the charts here. We'll start with the, the amillennial chart. And what I want you to be thinking about as we look through these again briefly here this morning is in these three rapture texts, as we look down at the text, the text forces our eyes to look up. Not a Jesus coming down to the earth, but a Jesus in heaven coming for his people, meeting them in the air, and going back to the place he's prepared for his disciples. Our eyes are up, our heads are up, we're, we're looking up in all of these passages. In the, in the amillennial view of things, you, you basically have the, the age now and the age to come, and what is between these two ages? One singular event, Jesus comes down to the earth, there all the judgments take place, the new heavens and new earth replace the old heavens and old earth. There is one event, and two ages. These three texts we look at do not fit that model. We are made by these three passages to be looking up to to something else that happens before the, the finality of the events of Revelation 21, the demolition of the old universe and the creation of a new. All right, the next chart is the post millennial chart. Again here, the same idea, whatever the progress of the church through its era, you have one event, Christ returned to the earth, ushering in the new age. The, the, the idea that uh, Christians are resurrected or, or transformed, those who are alive and remain, and then go with Jesus to heaven, meet him in the air and return with him to the places he prepared, doesn't work in this chart. And then we'll look again at the post-tribulational chart. So again, I know this is all very confusing. Uh, Post-tribulationalism is premillennialism. That is, Jesus returns before the millennium. You can see that in the chart. The, The red arrow comes down to initiate the millennial kingdom reign of Christ on the earth for a thousand years. That's similar to what we believe. We're we're premillennial. Jesus comes back before the millennium. And the, the, the eternal state happens a thousand years after Christ has reigned on the earth. But the post-tribulational view believes in the rapture happening at the end of the tribulation, meaning the church goes through the tribulation, and at the end of the tribulation, the church goes up to meet Jesus in the air, and instead of Jesus making a U-turn, taking his disciples back to the places he prepared for them, the church makes the U-turn and comes down with Jesus in Revelation 19 to reign with him on the earth. Uh, which makes the the three passages we just looked at not quite fit. And and then go back to the the next one, the premillennial chart. Again, this is the one we're advocating, not that one. Yes, okay. (laughs) Okay, this is the one we're advocating uh, that, that we believe matches these three texts that give the details of what the rapture is and how it happens. And the how it happens is one of the pieces of the puzzle for when it happens. Do you understand the relationship? If the how it happens means the dead in Christ and those who are alive and remain meet Jesus in the air and go with him to the places he has prepared, that puts believers and Jesus back in heaven after the rapture, not on the earth. All the other views put Jesus on the earth. 
So the how it happens based on the details of the, these three passages has something very significant to say about the when it happens. All right, the next waypoint on our roadmap this morning is dealing with some secondary texts. So back to the outline on the screen. We've looked at the primary texts, and I would contend for you that that those are the three primary pre-tribulational rapture texts. There are other texts in Scripture that I would call secondary, which speak to the issues, but don't necessarily draw out all the same details. The first we're gonna look at is Revelation chapter three and verse 10. This is a promise given in this section of Revelation which are the letters to the seven churches. This is particularly given to the church at Philadelphia. And listen to the promise that Jesus gives. Revelation 3.10, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. What hour is that? That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Um, This is is a, a remarkable promise. I will keep you from the hour of testing. Uh, It's it's clear that this hour of testing Jesus describes as the hour of testing that's unfolded in Revelation 6 through 18. It is that tribulation period. It is the 70th week of Daniel. Daniel. It is the troubling of Jacob. All those descriptions of this period in scripture, uh, it is that period that Jesus called the worst period in human history. There's never been a time like it up to that point, nor will there ever be a time as bad as that after. This is the tribulation period of testing of the earth dwellers. And Jesus promises the church at Philadelphia that he will keep them from that hour. And one issue that has to be dealt with here in Revelation 3.10 as it relates to the rapture of the church, does what Jesus promised to Philadelphia apply to believers across the church age? In other words, is this the promise that can be claimed by believers of every church in the entirety of the church age, if Jesus promised Philadelphia that they would be kept out of that hour of testing, is this a promise to churches that believers in Jesus Christ will be kept out of the hour of testing? That is one significant interpretive issue. I would suggest to you that yes, uh, this is applicable, Uh, And and there are a couple of points of of evidence for that. One is, uh, Jesus says, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The church at, hey, Zach, Zach Han just walked in, and that just makes my heart go pitter-pat. It's good to see you, brother. And your dad, too. I mean, that's fine, but I didn't give you quite the same greeting, but welcome, Zach. I might do that again next hour. But you don't have to make the dramatic entrance. (laughs) The second issue in this text is what does it mean to be kept from the period of global testing of earth dwellers? And the little phrase here is a a verb, I keep, I will keep, and a preposition. Uh, It is a preposition which means out of or or from. And, And... This could mean, and and some people contend that it means, that Jesus will protect the church through it or, or in it so that the church will not be harmed even though the church remains in the tribulation. Or this keep you from means Jesus will remove you out of it so that you will not be there to experience it. And there is only one other time this same verb and the same preposition are used anywhere in the New Testament. And I believe it holds to the idea that the church is to be kept out of the tribulation, not kept in it. Okay, there's only one other use in the New Testament where this occurs, and the same meaning holds. Uh, That is, Jesus' promise here to the church at Philadelphia, and I believe by application to the church age, is the church will be kept away from or out of, not experiencing the tribulation. What's significant about this letter is, Philadelphia had passed the test of perseverance. In other words, they had endured. They had faced tribulations. This isn't an escapist idea. As if the church is designed by God to never experience hardship. No, the church had experienced hardship. Philadelphia was faithful under fire. 
What they will not experience is the great tribulation. The, that tribulation period that God is planning for the world for some very specific purposes, purposes we will get to next week, purposes for the unbelieving world and for unbelieving Israel. What will God do with those two entities during that time? But the promise here for the church at Philadelphia, and I believe by application to the churches, is that God will keep the church out of that hour of testing. Here's another secondary text, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 3. And 2 Thessalonians is a letter written to the same church that the letter of 1 Thessalonians was written to. Again, this is the church that Paul likely spent three weeks with and thought it important enough to teach them personally about eschatology and then wrote a follow-up letter detailing the pre-tribulational rapture and then writes a following letter dealing with a specific crisis. The specific crisis is that some had come into Thessalonica, into the church, and began teaching them, persuading them that they were already in the day of the Lord, that the day of the Lord had already come. And this disrupted them. This, this was a, a tragic infiltration of teaching that derailed them of the hope they were supposed to have, the encouragements they were supposed to have about the end times truths Paul had already taught them. Now look at verse one of chapter two. We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure that you not be disturbed by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord is present. And I think that's the right way to translate that. that We're not in the day of the Lord right now. How do we know? Let, Let no one in any way deceive you for it is not present unless the apostasy comes first. What is that? The, 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 the downgrade and complete falling away of faithfulness in anything that would call itself the church. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Who is that? That's the Antichrist, detailed in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, described here as the man of lawlessness. And notice what Paul says in verse 5, do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? So again, Paul taught them these things and someone else brought in a message, sent a letter, claiming it was from Paul or his associates and dismantling their eschatology. And what was the result? It was a disturbance. It removed from them the hope that biblical eschatology was supposed to give. And Paul has to write to correct it. A couple of things to notice there. He describes our gathering together with Jesus as important. And then he describes the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grammatically, it's, it's very clear in the original, these are two non-identical but related events. The coming of the Lord Jesus and our synagogue, synagogue our gathering together to him. That is, they are, they are related, but they're not identical. This allows the the way Paul is describing the day of the Lord in this passage to encompass a great series of end times events, including Jesus' return for his church and his coming to the earth. We'll deal more with the day of the Lord, Um, probably not this morning, next week and then in a sermon series to come. Um, But the point of 2 Thessalonians 1 um, is these two elements are critical for them to understand and critical for them to separate out. The rapture is not the same thing as the day of the Lord. It would be no comfort to the Thessalonian believers if they were in the day of the Lord and they had missed the rapture. (laughs) Do you understand the importance? If, however, the rapture was at the end of the tribulation, then being in the day of the Lord would get them closer to the rapture, and that would be a matter of great joy, which they were supposed to look forward to and encourage each other with. Paul's correction here flows out of his conviction that the rapture happens before the tribulation. Otherwise, this verse is no comfort to the Thessalonian believers. Another secondary text is 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Paul describes the Thessalonians and their coming to Christ. They left idolatry and turned to the one true God. 
And, and what did their turning to God look like? What did their repentance manifest in? Waiting for his son from heaven, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. That's interesting. What does it look like in this era to follow Jesus? To turn from false gods, any kind of idolatry, to turn from sin, to turn from self, to turn to the true and living God, to turn to Jesus Christ, to wait for Jesus' return. What does Jesus do when he returns? Rescues us from the coming wrath. What is that coming wrath in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians? It is God's wrath manifested against the earth dwellers during the day of the Lord. Jesus rescues us from us, from it, from that wrath. It's interesting, this, the word coming, uh, some translations have the wrath to come. It is in a present tense, the sort of ongoing reality. It is a wrath that's coming, again, pressing this doctrine of imminence. This could happen at any point. It could be a thousand years from now. It could be in five minutes. We are to live with that anticipation. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, another secondary text. Really, the, the whole section of verses 1 to 11, dealing with the day of the Lord and the judgment associated with return of Messiah. Uh, I, I won't take the time to read all of it. But look what, look what Paul says in verse 4 of chapter 5. You, brethren, are not in darkness that that day would overtake you. Um, you're, you're not built for that day. Look at verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath. What is the wrath he's talking about? He's talking about the wrath in this context of the day of the Lord. The tribulation period wrath. God's judgment from heaven against earth dwellers detailed in chapters 6 through 18 of Revelation. And God has not destined you Thessalonians for that. That doesn't detail for us the details of the rapture, but it is a secondary text because it tells us that God has not intended the church to go through that period. This is significant as we put all of these things together. And, and some would say that the wrath detailed in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 is not day of the Lord wrath, but eternal hell wrath. And there's no mistaking that the day of the Lord wrath in this context involves the wrath of God poured out on earth dwellers during the time of the, of the, of the tribulation, which will eventually culminate in eternal hell wrath, lake of fire wrath poured out by God against all those who don't believe. That is true. And it is possible that 1 Thessalonians 5.9 has a big picture of wrath. But even if it is just a big picture of wrath, it includes in this context tribulation wrath for which believers are not destined. Believers in the church age are not destined. Uh, two other secondary texts I'll have you write down or, or just think about. One is Philippians 3.20 and 21, which describes the transformation. We're citizens of heaven, but we must be transformed. You, you can't get in in your present state. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 49, we, we read that last week, details what the resurrection, the glorious resurrection unto glorified bodies event looks like. Sown in weakness, raised in power, sown natural, raised supernatural. All of those details. Uh, those are secondary texts to the resurrection rapture event because they describe what will happen in that transformation. And then I would point you to texts like Matthew 13, Matthew 24, Matthew 25, and Luke 17 that all give an interesting depiction of end times events. So turn to Matthew 13 for a moment. And I just want you to see a pattern because these, these events, the, these are not rapture passages. These are return of Christ to the earth judgment passages. And they detail for us a contrast where our eyes are not looking up to meet the Lord in the air and go be with him in heaven and, and do the things that the Bible describes will happen during that time in heaven. They have us looking down to the earth and what will happen when Jesus returns to the earth. This is a different kind of return. Not a meeting saints in the air, but a coming for judgment to the earth. There's a contrast. Look at Matthew 13, verse 39. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are angels. Now, that's just a terrifying thought. Supernatural beings with giant reaping, 
blades in their hands going out to harvest the earth. A sobering, terrifying reality of coming judgment. Just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks, those who commit lawlessness. They will throw them into the furnace of fire, and that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Look down at verse 49. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. They will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Turn to Matthew 24. Verse 37. So if you're looking at the outline above and secondary text in red, this is not a rapture text. (laughs) Okay. This is not the rapture. L- listen carefully. Verse 37. The coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So the coming of the Son of Man will be. Then there will be two men in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women grinding at the mill, one will be taken, one will be left. This is not the rapture. Despite Larry Norman's song, two men walking up a hill, one disappears and one's left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. You heard that song? Any any Larry Norman fans? No, you heard it from DC Talk and that is a criminal cover of a great Larry Norman song. Out of context, scripture passage, never mind. This was popularized in the the rapture movies that have come out. In fact, the the famed title, Left Behind, comes from the DC Talk song covering the Larry Norman song, coming from this passage, which is the wrong passage. Matthew 24 is not a taking to meet the Lord in the air, to be with him forever where he was and the places prepared for him by his father. This is a taking in judgment. Uh, The wicked are taken away, and and what remains? The righteous. This is a significant contrast. And Matthew 25 is the same way. Look at verse 30 of Matthew 25. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And verse 31 describes the judgment that that brings that about. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him. That's a Revelation 19 coming, not a 1 Thessalonians 4 meeting in the air. He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates a sheep from goats. He will put the sheep on His right, the goats on His left, and the king will say to those on His right, Come, you, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And look down at verse 41. Then He will say to those on His left, Depart from Me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Luke 17 gives the the same picture. All of these texts present a contrast. Uh, The order of events, the participants, the destinations, the destinies, they are all different than the three primary texts we look at related to the rapture. In the rapture, the godly are taken away and the remainder survive to endure judgment. At the return of the Lord of the earth, Revelation 19, Matthew 25, Matthew 13, Matthew 24, the ungodly are taken away to judgment and those who remain survive and enjoy millennial kingdom blessing. At the rapture, the godly meet Jesus in the air and are taken to be with him forever. At the return of the Lord, the ungodly are surprised like a thief, surprised as by a thief, and they are met by Jesus on the earth. Do you understand the contrast? When Jesus comes all the way to the earth, those who are taken out are the wicked. Those who remain are the righteous. When Jesus comes in the clouds, those who are taken out are the righteous, and the ones who remain are the wicked. Those are significant details. And these things run contrary to a a post-millennial view uh, where everything is one eschatological event. And they run contrary to a post-tribulational view where Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation. 
those views do not match these details. In fact, there is no scripture text that denies a pre-tribulational rapture, nor is there a single text in scripture that makes a pre-tribulational rapture untenable. I believe there are texts of scripture which make the other views untenable. And I do not believe there are any texts of scripture which demand any of the other views. When we look at the details of all of these things, both in the primary text and the secondary text, I believe there is one conclusion to come to. And that is Jesus comes for his church prior to the tribulation and removes his church out of the wrath that the unbelieving world is destined for during that period. All right, we'll move to the next part of our outline. And we're going to look at some indications Uh, indications. These are not necessarily proofs of a pre-tribulational rapture, but these are indications from Scripture that contribute to an understanding of a pre-tribulational rapture. Um, So none of these things by themselves would stand and say, hey, this means the, the rapture happens before the tribulation. But all of these things are in accord with it and may give some significant hints or indications at it. And the first indication we'll deal with is the church in the book of Revelation. Um, We'll also look at the the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ. We'll look at the purpose of the tribulation. What is the tribulation for, biblically? Who's it for? And then we'll look at the concept of the day of the Lord. Um, And and the first two we'll look at this morning. Uh, The next two we'll look at next week. This first one is the the relationship of the church to the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation has the word church in it 20 times and references to the church 21 to 22 times. But the word church or ecclesia shows up in the book of Revelation 20 times. It's, It's 18 times in the first three chapters, excuse me, 19 times in the first three chapters and one time in Revelation 22, 16. And Revelation 22, 16 just reminds us that the whole book was given as a circular letter to those seven churches in Asia Minor and to all who would have ears to hear. Here's Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. So you you have the word church in chapter 22, you have the word church 19 times in the first three chapters, and then between chapter 4 and chapter 18, zero times do you have the word church. That's interesting. John knows the word for church. The book of Revelation uses the word for church profusely. In fact, by percentages, a very high percentage of vocabulary in the book of Revelation compared to other books has the word church in it. But interestingly, that word ceases after chapter 3. But you do have believers from chapter 6 through 18. You do have followers of Jesus. They are never called the church. What are they called? You have names for them and you have instructions given to them but they're not called the church. They are called saints in chapter 5, chapter 8, chapter 11, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 16, chapter 17, and chapter 18. They are called saints, set apart ones, holy ones. They are called people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people who believe in chapter 5. They are called priests to God and a kingdom in chapter 5. They are called Uh, They are referred to as the souls of those slain. In other words, martyrs during the tribulation are now disembodied. They haven't yet experienced their resurrection and they are waiting for God to take vengeance on the earth dwellers who killed them. These are clearly people who died during the tribulation who are believers who show up in heaven, chapter six. They are called fellow slaves. They are called brethren who are killed. In chapter seven, believers during this time are called slaves of our God. In chapter 7, there are 144,000 of them called the ones sealed. Then there is an uncountable multitude, different than the 144,000, who are from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. They wear white robes. They are before the throne. They are tribulation martyrs, and it clearly includes Gentiles who believed the gospel during the tribulation and got killed for it. Then believers are called those who have the seal of God on their forehead, chapter 9. 
There are some who worship in the temple, and I think it's safe to assume in chapter 11 these are believers worshiping God in the rebuilt temple of that era. There are a couple believers in chapter 11 who are called the two witnesses or the olive trees or the lampstands. They are also called prophets. And then in chapter 11, you have slaves and prophets who fear your name. They are called saints. Then you have the picture of this woman in chapter 12. It is clearly the nation of Israel. And then they are called brethren in chapter 12. And then interestingly in 12, 17, you have the rest of that woman's children who keep the commandments of God, who hold to the testimony of Jesus. That is, non-Israelite believers. Again, Gentile believers during the tribulation. Believers are called those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The 144,000 are described in chapter 14 as those purchased from the earth. They are described as those who follow the Lamb. They are purchased as first fruits. They are called saints who keep the commandments of God and keep faith in Jesus. And there are some who are called those who die in the Lord. Chapter 15 describes those who are victorious over the beast in his image and over the number of his name. In chapter 16, we're told there are saints and prophets. Then believers in chapter 16 are called those who stay awake and keep their clothes. In chapter 17, they are called witnesses of Jesus. In chapter 17, they are also described as the ones who are with the Lamb. In chapter 17, verse 14, they are called the called, the chosen, the faithful. In chapter 18, they are called my people. And in chapter 19, they are called his slaves. Interestingly, Matthew 24, Jesus calls them the elect. It's amazing to have this broad array of titles for disciples, followers of Jesus, believers in the gospel, and never called the church. Never in any of the tribulation passages from the Old Testament, we wouldn't expect it, but from Matthew 24, 25, um, the Mark's account of the tribulation period, nor Luke's account, nor Revelation 6 through 18, do you have any instructions to the church for church governance, church polity, church offices, church responsibilities, church ordinances, church discipline? None of that is in those texts. The church is interestingly absent from every single tribulation text in your Bible. And yet there are believers, followers of Jesus, faithful, even martyrs. That's just an indication. All right, a second indication, and the last we'll look at this morning, is the doctrine of imminence. The doctrine of the imminent return of Christ Imminence is a New Testament doctrine. Jesus says multiple times in the book of Revelation, behold, I am coming quickly. In Luke 12, he warns, I am coming at a time you do not expect, so be like the kind of people who expectantly await my return. The master comes back at an hour, the slave does not know. This doctrine was a precious New Testament doctrine. I already referred to the fact that Paul used the term we, including himself and his associates, as possible inclusions in the resurrection rapture event. Paul believed it could happen in his day, and he wrote as if he believed it could. This was clearly a New Testament doctrine. Imminence was held in the early church. It was an early church hope. The first three centuries of the church was marked by an adherence to the doctrine of imminency. And the doctrine of imminency was lost, interestingly, in about the fourth century. Why? because persecution had come to an end in the Roman Empire. Eventually, the the pagan Roman Empire became the holy Roman Empire, holy in quotation marks, Uh, or eventually the, the state government church empire thing, while holding on to the pagan idolatries of, of the old Roman Empire, even the titles, interestingly, Pontifex Maximus, Uh, does not come from the Roman Catholic Church, but originates with the Caesars. And and, and along with all of the, the, um, uh, the, the altars and the pictures and the nomenclature, the church was corrupted. When the empire stopped persecuting Christians, it became easy to be a Christian. In fact, it, went, it became so easy to be a Christian because no longer were Christians being punished by the government 
They were being rewarded by the government. You could get a good government job by naming Christ, by being baptized, by joining the church. And that just fundamentally changed the doctrine of imminency. No longer was the church looking up saying, could it be today? They thought, ah, we've got it all now. That is an evidence or an illustration of the purifying reality of right biblical eschatology. When that goes away, it has an effect on the Christian life. And the church, frankly, got wrapped up in worldliness. Let's put up the charts again. I think I have these in order. Scotty, you've been so helpful. Uh, Think about this post-tribulational rapture. Does the doctrine of imminency fit here? I would say no, it doesn't. There are events which have to happen prior to Jesus coming for his church and coming to the earth. What are those events? Daniel's 70th week, the apostasy, the man of lawlessness, the antichrist setting up worship of himself in the temple, all of those things that are described, those have to happen before there is a return of Christ for his people. The doctrine of imminency goes away. Okay, next chart. This is the mid-tribulational or uh, the pre-wrath rapture are are both similar in this. Uh, That is, there are events, three and a half years, the first half of the 70th week of Daniel has to happen before Christ comes for his people. Imminency goes away. Next chart. Next chart. That's the confusing one, kind of the same idea. In post-millennialism, the doctrine of imminency goes away. Why? Because the church has to build the kingdom either by gospel proclamation and missions or by government and politics and culture, whichever way you take post-millennialism. All of that stuff has to happen first. Jesus doesn't come back until we're in the golden age, until we've set up the world in a way that's fit for him. The doctrine of imminency goes away. Next chart. Okay, that's the other version of post-millennialism. Next chart. In the amillennialism, same thing. The, 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 the doctrine of eminency. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Amillennialism can have a doctrine of imminency. In other words, the only thing we're looking forward to is Jesus' return. One event separates the age now and the age to come. We're not building the kingdom. We're not waiting around for anything. Jesus could come at any time. And let me suggest to you the problem with imminency and amillennialism. The problem is missions. The problem is missions. Listen to Matthew 24, verse 14. Jesus made a promise, and this is as inviolable as any of the other promises he makes. This gospel, this good news of the kingdom, shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end shall come. What does that mean? Well, that's in line with Revelation 5, where you see surrounding the throne of the Lamb, people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. Missions works. Jesus said, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus said he would go get his sheep. He would lay down his life for them. All of that gets fulfilled. If Jesus could return at any time, if Jesus had returned in the first century, had the gospel gone to all the earth and all the nations yet? Nope. If Jesus came now, has that task been finished, friends? No. And so while all millennialism can uphold the New Testament doctrine of the imminent return of Christ, it cannot do so and uphold missions at the same time. I would contend for you that the only view that allows the doctrine of imminency to stand and allows missions to be completed is a pre-tribulational view. And and that has a significant implication for the church. Uh, In the book of Revelation, during the tribulation period, you see the gospel being proclaimed to people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. Do you know what that means? It means if the church fails at missions before Jesus comes for his church, God will not fail at missions. He'll clean it up in the tribulation. And I think this is an indictment of the church, if you think about it. 
Great Commission, first century, early first century. Age of Exploration in the 16th century, you know, 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And, and what happened after that? Technological advancement of ships went everywhere. And, and where did they go and what did they do? They went to explore, they went to get spices from places like Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. They went to get ivory and, and man slaves out of Africa. They went to pillage and plunder every continent. And they haven't yet finished the gospel work. What are we, this is the 21st century, 16th century, 500 years since we had all of that technology and we haven't finished it yet. That's a serious indictment. We must be about the Lord's work. It is not in vain. And we do all of that with the glorious hope of the anticipation of his return. We'll pick up more of this. Again, if you have questions that you would like me to tackle next week, that's kind of our last week to, to, uh, to tackle those things, send me an email or a text. I've got five or six questions that were asked last week written down, and we'll walk through those. But just send me anything that you want clarity on uh, for next week and we'll finish up. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would long for your appearing and it would have its intended result, that we would be pure, that we would be eager, that we would be ready in anticipation, that we would uh, be belted in readiness, as you say in Luke 12, eager to open the door when the master returns, and in the meantime, laboring faithfully at the tasks you have given us. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.